Good morning. Welcome, everybody. It's good to be back. We had a great vacation. Gave some thought to staying in the mountains, but we decided, decided we better come back. So I invite the ushers to go ahead and, and uh, pass the welcome basket. And while they're doing that, I uh, invite the kids to come on down here. Good morning. I missed you guys. How are you doing? Yeah? Got a couple questions for you this morning. Any of you guys ever eat so much food you felt like your stomach was going to explode and you couldn't eat another bite? Did you? What did you eat? Ice cream? Yeah? You? you, you. Yeah, go ahead. Burgers? What'd you eat? You got filled up on vegetables? Ooh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding, yeah. All right, well, let me ask you another question. Have you ever been so hungry that your stomach was growling, you had the grum belly, and you just feel like, oh, I gotta get some food? You ever, you ever feel like that? Yeah? You too? Yeah? You know what makes it even worse? When somebody eats in front of you, when you're really hungry like that, and your stomach's growling. And, well, let, me, let me show you what I, what I mean here. Let me, let me show you. Here's, you'll see what happens, you know, when, uh, when somebody eats in front of you, when you're hungry. That's, doesn't it get worse? Watch. Does it get worse? Oh. Oh. Brian, would you want to come in? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would definitely come. Alright, Brian, Brian, here you go, buddy. Oh, well, I didn't come. No, 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 it's for Brian, it's for Brian. Oh, thank you. Brian, let, eat, it, eat it with me, Brian. Oh, it's got sprinkles on it. Oh, it's so good. I love it's sprinkles. so good. Sprinkles. I'm going to eat oh, it. Oh, oh, that's so good. Oh, good. Did it make you hungry? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh wow. Man, oh, man. Really good. Oh, I love it. Really, really good. Nice. <laughs> Oh, wow. You know, Brian, that might possibly be the single best cupcake I've ever had in my life. So, yeah. Gosh, that was good. We're going to talk about this morning about being hungry, but we're also going to talk about being filled. Okay? God wants us to be hungry for Him. You know, like, like when you have that grum bellies and you watch Him and see that cupcake? God wants us to be hungry for Him. And he says, I will fill you up. Like you were talking about when you ate so much, you're, you're ready. But, but he's talking about like in your heart, in your soul. He'll, he'll fill you up really completely inside. And that's, that's what our scripture is about today. But that's true for everybody. If we hunger after God and we get that, that grum belly hunger for God, then he fills us up. And that's one of the cool things about having a relationship with Jesus. Not with cupcakes. <laughs> you, well... Get over here. That's my stash. Me and Brian are going to eat all those. All right, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for cupcakes. Thank you for this day. Thank you for these kids. I pray that they will always have a hunger in their heart for you, Lord, to know you and to, to have a relationship with you. And I pray that you would fill them up and bless them all the days of their lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. All right. All right. I think there's... There's cupcakes. Wait, wait, wait. We're giving to Mr. Brian. Mr. Brian will take care of the cupcakes. Yeah. There's a lot more kids following the cupcakes than we're sitting up here. Did you notice that? Well, we've had two weeks off from, from looking at the Beatitudes and our Attitude Adjustment Series. We're going to kind of jump back in that and, and look at, at the fourth Beatitude. Uh, the Beatitudes, just a little refresher, uh, are, are taken from probably what is the greatest sermon ever given, which is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it was very early in his ministry and it includes eight blessings. And, and the blessings really are, are two part. They have a, a characteristic or a condition, uh, which is the attitude part, and, and then the result, the reward part. That, that God promises there'll, there'll be a reward 
if your heart is, has this kind of attitude or condition. And, and when, when Jesus says, blessed are, he, he, meaning kind of leans towards happiness, but it goes way deeper than that. It's really talking about joy, something way down much further and deeper, uh, much, much more below the surface than, than just happiness is. And uh, it, it paints the, the picture. These, these eight Beatitudes, when they're taken together, paint a pic picture of, of what a life looks like walking with Jesus. These are actually things that we, Jesus is saying, this is, this is what you should be doing. This is, this is how your life should look. And, and, and that we need to, we hold our hearts up to, to this example that he's given us. That's as, as an x-ray. Uh, uh, and we x-ray our hearts and say, hey, is this, is this where I'm at? Is how, how close to Jesus' heart does my heart look? And, and that's, so that's, that's what he's challenging us to, to do here. And, and the, ones, the Beatitudes that we've talked about so far, they've actually been progressive in, in nature. Our first one, just, just a quick review, as it was blessed are the poor in spirit, and, and where we recognize our need. We actually realize, I, I'm... I'm a, I fall a little bit short in some areas, especially in the spiritual areas of my life. And the second one was, blessed are those who mourn. We actually repent and we're sorry for our sin. And we feel a, a sorrow in our heart that I've sinned against God, not just my, you know, my fellow human beings. And, and we, we mourn over that. We feel a sorrow in our heart. And the third one was, blessed are the meek, where we empty ourselves and we begin to depend on God. We realize that we are sinful and, 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 and we're sorry for that. And so we begin to depend on him and we allow the Holy Spirit to begin directing our lives. Then we're ready to be filled. And that's where we are this morning. That brings us to our verse this morning, which is Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. There was a family who had a habit of treating their kids to ice cream after church on Sunday morning. And... And, and Dad decided, you know, I'm going I'm to break that habit this morning, which is not easy to do. And, and the kids were whining and crabbing and moaning and complaining. They weren't happy with that. And Dad decided to get all spiritual with them. And he said, where in the Bible does it say that you, we need to be fed immediately after church every week? Ah, but the kids were smarter. The kids were smarter than Dad. They said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after all the righteousness, for they will be filled. <laughs> they got their ice cream. They got the ice cream. And that's what we're talking about here this morning. And we're going to break it down a little bit, the condition or attitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does that mean? What exactly does that mean? I'm not sure people have a real clear understanding of, of what that is. And when I, in a second here, I'm going to have uh, Sandy um, throw up a, 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 a short video where the, the, it's going to be people talking, but there will be five questions that are answered. You'll see little headings underneath when the questions change. I'll give you the first two questions, and, and uh, they'll make sense, and then I'll kind of maybe just read those out as, as we change uh, to, the, to the individual questions. But first two questions are, what do you think it means to be righteous? And the second question is, when Jesus said, blessed are those who seek righteousness, what do you think he meant? Got a real hodgepodge, uh, hodgepodge of answers. So go ahead and play that, Sandy. Exactly sure to be honest. In the, in the context of the world right now, I wouldn't be able to even answer that question, I don't think. So. Righteous, um, you know, living true, true to yourself and true to everyone else, you know, not being deceitful, I suppose. It's got a lot of different meanings, you know, like just don't do, don't harm anybody, don't do anything like you wouldn't do to harm yourself. I don't, I'm not sure because I'm not religious. <laughs> He's saying that all of those who seek after Him because his righteousness are blessed because we can't be right by ourselves and so seeking to um, get to know him is is what makes us blessed well I, I was thinking about maybe seeking righteousness is seeking Jesus like Jesus was is righteous and maybe seeking righteousness is seeking Jesus and seeking to follow him and and, yeah, following him means having the same attitude, developing the same attitude. It may not be perfect because you're a human, but a willingness to follow Jesus and develop in yourself those areas of your life he wants to see developed and that. Walk the path of Jesus, I suppose, pretty much, yeah. Well, it's pretty much about the, um, the individual trying to do the best they can do, you know. 
not conforming to the crowd. Uh, the people in the community who could have power or would seek to have the power to help those around them who, who desperately needed it. That means uh, love your neighbour. That's, 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 that's the main thing that I, I can understand. I think it provides more satisfaction. Do justice for those who need make you righteous? I don't think it makes you more righteous, but I think it provides satisfaction for the self and and it certainly makes the world a better place. Yeah, I believe so because uh, at the end of the day, if you help others at the same uh, at the same time, there is something that that you will be rewarded. It may be not in mature things, but be probably in a other way that probably God has planned for you. It depends on on what their their uh, reason for working with the poor is, whether that's for helping the poor or for. Uh, making themselves feel better or whatever. Honestly, I uh, had a thing what for a girl like who was into reason? social justice and I had nothing, but I was just trying to you know, impress her and pick her up. So I went along with that kind of stuff, and um, yeah, it, it sort of it sort of caught on. Um, I mean, there's like the basic things of what I buy. Where is that coming from? And so if I can support um, things that are fair trade or um, like cooperatives and that sort of thing, then that's going to be really positive. Um, thing to do. Even if I go somewhere to buy something, I've got five cents, ten cents in my pocket, I put it in a, in a charity bit in front of me, or if I walk past someone, I never keep the change, I always give it to someone every day of my life. Because I don't need the change, but everybody else needs that change to make the change. By me moving, by me changing, uh, everybody else is going to change. That's what I think. At the moment, because I'm a family person, I probably look on how to um, just to be more help my family as well and then at the same time um, my other fellow friends. Probably that's I think I, I have to do more. I suppose it's the old um, they tr treat other people like you want to be treated. Um, that, that really gets, that's the bottom line I suppose. A couple of ladies got it a little bit right but did you see how far off track some of the people, I mean one guy I'm going to pick up a girl and fair trade and so, and, and many of their answers had to do with, 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 with being a good person or, or, or self. Really a lot of confusion there. They just really didn't understand that. An awful lot of missing the mark, but they're not the only ones who missed the mark. In 2009, George Barna, who's a Christian uh, himself, uh, did a survey and he asked pastors, how many people in your congregation believe that their relationship with God is the single most important thing in their life? How many people? And the pastors were pretty, pretty positive about that. They, they said, uh, on the average, approximately, uh, most of the pastors said approximately 70% of the people in our congregation consider God, their relationship with God, the most important thing in their life. One out of six pastors said as many as 90% of the people in our congregation consider that the single most important thing in their life. When they asked people, a, a, a representative group of people, same question. How many of you consider your relationship with God the most important thing in your life? 15%. 15% of the people said, my relationship with the Lord is the most important thing in my life. So the pastors are thinking this, and the people are saying, no, this is, this is where it really, this is, this is what's really uh, uh, going on. And, and Barna felt the pastors were uh, actually pretty dumb. You ever, you ever think pastors were, were kind of dumb? I'm sure you have. I have. I'm, but, but his conclusion was that, that the pastors based a lot of their belief on, on, on two things. People making a commitment to Christ somewhere in their life and, and whether they show up at stuff. Whether they attend things. Whether, whether they come. They completely ignored in their answers the kind of things that show spiritual maturity, co commitment to personal worship and study, tithing, accountability. Pastors ignored all of that. And, and, and so, so they're thinking people are where they need to be and people are saying, no, we're hungry. We, we're, we're, it's not the most important thing in our life. But they, they recognize that, that they're hungry for something. And so there's a real disconnect there. And in the middle of all that, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They will be filled. Such a disconnect. The pastor's unawareness and, and the 85% of the people who hunger after something else above their relationship with God. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you if you're part of the 15% or the part of the 85%. I won't ask you that. But, but we do need to ask, what does it mean 
to hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does that mean? Break it down. We'll do that. We'll do the hunger and thirst part. I, I had a real hunger to go see the Smoky Mountains. We haven't been there in years, and Jenny a couple times tried to try to get me to go to some mountains in Michigan. They're closer and probably wouldn't have cost as much. And I'm like, we're going to the Smokies. I got to get to the Smokies, and and I, I did. I felt I felt a hunger to to get there. But but you know what? There's there's, there's a hunger way deeper than that. It's way that's not the kind of hunger we're talking about. Psalm 42, 1 and 2 says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? As, as the worship team uh, sang this morning. It was so, I, I mean, a, a, a deer panting for, for streams of water. Hunger, a, a thirst there. Where can, my, where can I meet with God? By, by definition, hunger and thirst is, is really means to, to crave intensely, even to the point of suffering. My craving for the Smoky Mountains didn't really qualify, but I want to read you a story that I think does qualify for that intense craving, that intense hunger. This is from a, a, a story or a book uh, called Desire, and it's, it's an account of the British liberation of Palestine by Major V. Gilbert in the Last Crusade. And it's a pretty amazing story, and I'd like to read it for you. Driving up from Beersheba, a combined force of British, Australian, and New Zealanders were pressing on the rear of the Turkish retreat over arid desert. The attack outdistanced its water-carrying camel team. Water bottles were empty. The sun blazed pitilessly out of a sky where the vultures wheeled expectantly. Our heads ached, writes Gilbert, and our eyes became bloodshot and dim in the blinding glare. Our tongues began to swell. Our lips turned a purplish black and burst. Those who dropped out of the column were never seen again. But the desperate force battled on to Sharia. There were wells at Sharia, and had they been unable to make, take the place by nightfall, thousands were doomed to die of thirst. We fought that day, writes Gilbert, as men fight for their lives. We entered Sharia Station on the heels of the retreating Turks. The first objects with which met our view were great stone cisterns full of cold, clear drinking water. In the still night air, of, uh, the sound of, of water running into the tanks could be distinctly heard, maddening in its nearness. Yet not a man murmured when orders were given for the battalions to fall in too deep facing the cisterns. He then describes the stern priorities. The wounded, those on guard duty, then company by company. It took four hours before the last man had his drink of water. And in all that time, they had been standing 20 feet from a low stone well on the other side of which were thousands of gallons of water. Can you even imagine the thirst that they felt at that point, the hunger and the thirst for water, standing there four hours, lips burst, fighting all night, and they had to stand and, and wait. Even, you know, that, as the deer pants for streams of water, way, way beyond that even. I just, I can't even, I was trying to put myself in their shoes and I've never even been anywhere very close to that. I used to, I used to run long distance and, and get really thirsty. You know, when, you're, when, you're, when you are, are physically active, whether, whether you know this or not, your, your, your body needs water 10 minutes before your mouth tells you it needs it, before you get thirsty. And these men were so far beyond that. They were so far beyond that. Hunger and thirst are daily needs. They're powerful, powerful physical needs. And Jesus is using them as a metaphor. He's using them as, as a metaphor to show us how powerful our spiritual needs are. Our spiritual needs are just as powerful. And, and how hungry and thirsty we need to be for Him. We need to have that kind of hunger for our relationship with Him. Not the Smoky Mountains kind of hunger, but, but the kind of hunger of those guys that were standing there four hours after they finally battled into the city and they had to step listening to the water run the entire four hours. That kind of hunger. So what does it mean to have this craving for righteousness? What, what is righteousness? If, if we have this intense in, in craving and desire, this hunger and this thirst, even to the point of suffering, 
what does that mean when applied to, to righteousness? How, how does that look? We're going to simplify that to, to really just a, a two-part definition of, of righteousness, which revolves around God and man. And the first part is, is about having a right relationship. That hunger and thirst for a, a right relationship, a, a, a true relationship with him, with, which calls for the forgiveness of sin. And having that personal intimacy with Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 21 and 22 says, But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Not just any kind of relationship, but one that comes through faith in Christ. A, a relationship apart from the law. The Pharisees thought they were righteous. They thought they were the most righteous guys anywhere. They, they thought they, they had attained that status. In fact, they, they thought they set the standard, as a matter of fact. And, and, and Jesus says in Matthew 5.20, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So whatever level the Pharisees thought they had, Jesus says, hey, there's something way above that. And, and if you don't get over where the Pharisees are, which is following the law, being a nice person, some of the things they, they kind of referred to here, he said, you won't enter the kingdom of, of heaven. Galatians 2.21 said, if our righteousness could be gained through the law, that means obeying the law, doing the right things, living in a good way, if righteousness could be gained that way, Christ died for nothing. He wouldn't have had to go to the cross if we could gain righteousness that way. We wouldn't have need Jesus to do what he did. So obviously, there's a problem there. You cannot, we, we, none of us can achieve righteousness. In spite of some of the answers you heard, none of us can possibly uh, achieve righteousness on our own. And, and Jesus wants them to see it's not about what men think. It's not about one, what men think or, or based on eternal appearances. It's, it's based on our Lord's assessment of our heart. How he looks at our heart and he sees exactly what is going on. Because we, it, that stacks up to his perfection. Not to anybody else. If I'm in a room full of 30 criminals, I might be feeling like, wow, I'm a really pretty good person here. I'm not in jail. and I, 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 I pastor and I pray and I do all this good stuff. I, I might be thinking like, wow, I'm, I'm pretty good. He said, don't do that. You don't compare yourself to other human beings. I don't care how good or bad they are. You compare yourself to me, to my perfection. And we are righteous when and only when we are in a right relationship with Christ. When we have a personal relationship with him, when we've trusted him for the forgiveness of our sins, when we've invited him to be the Lord of our life, there's nothing we can do to become righteous on our own. We need help. And where does that help come from? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We might become his righteousness. It, not a human righteousness, but his. And, and Jesus is the only one uh, capable of, of, of doing that. And, and really, he, he imputes or attributes his righteousness to us. And we give him our sin. That's a pretty good trade. That's not a bad trade at all. Jesus' righteousness, we give him our sin, our junk, all of our, our crud. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of, of God. So, so if I'm hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the first thing I need is, is to have that hunger and that thirst for that kind of a relationship, for his righteousness, knowing that on my best day, doing my best stuff, I still fall way short. I still fall way short. Second thing. After, after a right relationship, I need right living. Not that I earn anything or gain anything, uh, but I need to hunger and thirst to live my life right. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness is one of the things that defines the kingdom of God. It's, it's not a righteousness as man defined, it defines it. It's the righteousness that Jesus gives us. And we have to live that out. Matthew 6, uh, 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Again, it's, it's God's standard. 
Isaiah 64 says, our human righteousness is like filthy rags. Filthy rags. Our human righteousness is filthy rags. It just doesn't measure, measure up. So if I'm hungering and thirsting for righteousness, in addition to that right relationship, I need to, to be living right to, to his standard. Not my standard, not the world's standard, not my spouse's standard, but his standard of, of righteousness. And, and as I live out my life, can I ask myself, does, does it resemble the life of Jesus as recorded in the gospel? And it's not going to look exactly like it, because I'm a sinful human being, but I darn sure ought to start resembling it in some way. Do, if people were, were to look at, at, my, at my life, would, would they start to see some of the things that he taught? The way that he loved people, the way that he prayed, the way that he talked to his father, the serving, the sacrifice, the obedience to his Father, would they see that? Do I seek forgiveness for my sin? Am I, am I obedient to, uh, to the word of God? Do I strive to give God the glory in my life? Is scripture the guideline for my decisions? And that's just barely scratching the surface of, of what right living is. But but it's, it's, it's moving in that direction. And... and, and you know, if those things don't describe my life, then maybe I need to look at my life. Maybe I need to take a look at that. So I need that right relationship, but I, but I also need to live it out, right living. And, and, and then I'm, move, I'm, heading, I'm moving towards what would be considered righteousness, as Jesus describes it here. So if, if, if that describes my heart, that deep, passionate desire for that relationship and that equal hunger and thirst to, to live that out towards God and, and towards people every day of my life, then there's a great reward. A huge reward. Jesus says, you'll be filled. Satisfied. Much, much like those soldiers in Sharia, especially the ones who waited the additional four hours. Can you imagine the fulfillment and the satisfaction they must have felt when they finally got to drink water? I, I can't even imagine. What, but that's what Jesus is saying. That's what I got for your soul, for your heart. That's it. Yeah. Picture yourself. We got Thanksgiving coming up pretty soon, and, and a lot of us eat a little bit more than we normally do. And uh, I know a number of people go to two families, and, and they eat actually two times, two dinners. And and, and they're like, oh, I can't even move. I can't. I'm gonna bust. I, I'm sure some of you have experienced that, and, and and that's how it'll be with our soul. It'll be filled up like that, ready to bust, filled. Jesus is saying, if you want to be satisfied, if you want to be filled, start with that passionate, intense craving for me and then desire to live it out. And you will be filled. The psalmist says this in Psalm 107.9, For he satisfies the thirsty, he fills the hungry with good things. No junk food. Jesus does not fill us with cupcakes and junk food. He fills us up with things that are good for us. Like the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the kind of things that he fills us up with. Another major benefit, it's free. Completely, 100% free to you and me because Christ paid for it. Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2 says this. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread? And your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And your soul will delight in the richest of fare. The Lord is giving us an, an invitation to come and be filled up to the deepest part of our heart and our soul. To be completely filled for free. Completely full, completely free with the best and richest food that you could get. Daily. Anybody think you could find the best restaurant in Cleveland that would feed you daily? Till you, you were ready to bust and not charge you a dime? That's really what Jesus is saying here. Because he's already paid the tab. John 6.35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Again, filling your soul in, in, in such a way that you stay filled. No longer uh, emptiness. As we, we can boot emptiness out of our life. 
he, he says, I'll constantly be with you. You will be filled. And, and you know, Jesus is, 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 is getting, trying to get us to see that a, a hunger and thirst are our primary physical needs. Same, same with our spiritual needs. Well, he says, you know, you have to always eat and you have to always drink. He says, not so with your soul. Well, that's where, that's where the, it's a little different. He says, you'll never, you'll never be thirsty. You'll never be hungry. I will fill you up. And only he can do that. Only Christ is able to do that. As, as, we, as we celebrate communion this morning, we, we symbolize that, a, a Christ filling us with his body and his blood. And he said, you will never thirst and you will never go hungry. So, so we need to ask ourselves, are you filled here this morning or are you sensing some emptiness within? For whatever reason, is there an inner hunger or thirst jabbing at you? Uh, maybe that you've not been able to, you just can't quite put your finger on, on what that is? Or is your soul satisfied beyond measure? Or do you sense something missing? Just something definitely missing. Are you hungering or thirsting for righteousness? Or are you more hungry for the things the world has to offer? Security, acceptance, romance, significance, power, fame, riches, beauty, sexuality, whatever. Or are you longing for the greater intimacy with God and the people that you care most about? Do you believe that God can fill your soul in such a way? He's more than willing, but it starts with each of us having that hunger and that thirst for righteousness, for that right relationship with him, for that right living of that out in my life. If you really want to be filled, we, we, we can't bypass that. We just, we cannot bypass that. Right relationship, right living, hunger and thirst, and you will be filled. We search everywhere for that. We search everywhere and we try all kinds of different things. And the 85% of those people that, 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 that said, it's just, God's not the most important thing in my life. I, I wonder where they're looking. I wonder where they're looking. I, I'm going to guess they're not going to find what they're looking for because they're looking in the wrong place. They're looking in the wrong place. So, so search in the right place because the promise is you will be filled. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the words of, of Jesus. One simple sentence, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled, but there's such a challenge in it. There's such a challenge in it, Lord. And I pray that, that you would give each of us that kind of hunger and that kind of thirst that those men that fought all night and waited and waited for, more, for their water, that you would give us that kind of hunger and that kind of thirst for you, Lord. I pray that we would seek that and desire that and, and sense that in our heart. And, and, and Lord, I pray that you would fill us as you promise, as, as, you, as you give us in your word, Lord, that you would do. Lord, I pray that for each person here. I pray that for my own life too, Lord. I, I lift that up to you. And... Uh, Father, I, I desire to be filled with you through your Holy Spirit, through the Lord Jesus, through... I, I'm tired of, 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 of not being filled. So Lord, we lift that up to you for each of us, and uh, we pray that you would bless us richly as, as we work towards that. And we pray all these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to celebrate communion today, and again, we're going to just look at it from from a point of of, of filling, which is which is that's why Jesus offered again the analogy of 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 bread and water, our basic human needs, our basic human need of of, of taking care of our sin, our spiritual needs, all contained within celebrating the sacrament of communion. All, everything we just talked about is just kind of in a nice little package here as we celebrate the sacrament of communion.